In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. <coughs> All right, so we are talking revolution this weekend. And I thought, let's move it from the theoretical into the practical. I actually traveled to Cairo shortly after the revolution. So um, I think we um, started on in, in January, 25th of January, and then uh, Mubarak stepped down on the 11th of February. I was in Cairo on the 14th. And it it was it was an interesting. All these all these people just want to road into the kingdom. You know what they say about a cup of, of water? Yes, that's right. Cup of cold water. Absolutely. <laughs> Imagine, imagine what a tea does for you. <laughs> so, um, we'll start again so you can edit all of that out. <laughs> May have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> nice to see you this morning. <laughs> The revolution, I think, we've been speaking about in the theological terms, and we've been covering so much of what we can take with us from the experience of Egypt and the Middle East. And this whole time, those of you who are following politics, they call the Arab Spring at the moment. Um, it's a time of change throughout a whole region. And as with anything in our lives, as Christians, we need to look at matters to go around with us from very simple things like taking the bus to work in the morning to watching revolutions and seeing what we can learn from these things. Because there are so many messages we can pick up <clears throat> from these things that supposedly have nothing to do with us, but can actually be very relevant. I, um, I was in Cairo earlier this year, just after the revolution. It all started on 20th of January. And I was supposed to travel on the 7th of February. But obviously at the time, there was still <clears throat> a 3 p.m. curfew, which meant that I usually when I go to Cairo, I'd go for a couple of days to do things and then go back. And really, it would have been totally unachievable. Nothing could have been done in that time. So I postponed. Um, and Mubarak stepped down on the 11th, Friday the 11th. I was in Cairo on uh, Monday the 14th directly after it. And it was, it was a very strange time for Egypt. It was very euphoric. It was very, very joyful, very exciting. People were on a high. Um, I actually drove through Tahrir Square that day that I turned up, and I bought, I bought a whole lot of these Egyptian flags, the little Egyptian flags, and the other the, um, ID cards that everyone was wearing. And I, I, brought, I bought a whole lot of those and took them back to England for the young people there and gave them out as souvenirs. Mm -hmm. And we actually had a prayer day for Egypt where we gathered all the Egyptian churches. We, had a, we have a, uh, an evangelical church, we have a Baptist church in London. Gathered them all together at the center and we had a prayer day for Egypt for the whole Christian, Egyptian Christian church. And we had all these flags waving and things. It was really nice to be able to have that environment. And I wanted to share some of my own reflections during that very short 48 hour period that I was there. And by the way, I have this one souvenir. I was thinking to bring it today and I've completely forgot it. As I was driving through Tahrir Square during that night, um, I stopped the car and picked up a rock. One of the rocks that were being hurled I suppose, during the demonstrations. And that sits on my desk as a memento of, of that revolution. It, it sits next to um, 
a piece of um, stone I have that was once off the Berlin Wall. And I think both of those are <clears throat> they're very sort of parallel things that have gone on where whole regions have changed. And that's why I've been saying to you over the last couple of days, don't underestimate your desire for change. Just don't sit on your hands and think that it's only going, that it's never going to happen. Your desire for change is very important. And spiritually, if it starts with your life, then it can change lots of things. So, let me share some of these thoughts with you. Looking at the revolution from a distance, um, and if you followed the news of the struggle, you saw that it was sort of very up and down, very uncertain. It would start sometimes, news would be very victorious, and becomes very turbulent becomes very violent. At some stage it looked like it was completely futile, where nothing could be done, and really, what's the point? It wasn't needed. It's a storm in a teacup, it's going to fall, all of these things. And it's very difficult for us sometimes to be able to reconcile all of these ideas in our own heads, because that's what happens with our concept of spiritual struggle. Sometimes they think, yes, I'm going to do this. You sit at a convention or a retreat like this, you hear, um, you hear you know, people presenting material like this to you. You'll have Bible studies, you'll have your workshop groups, you'll be singing spiritual songs, you'll attend the liturgy. You're really uplifted and think, this is real. This can happen. Sometimes you'll go sit with your confession father, Yes, this can happen, and you come out and you feel very victorious, and you feel like it's very relevant. You feel, I can do it. Go a few days and think, hang on, really? Can I do this? Look around you, look at all the temptation, look at everything, look at the world. And then sometimes you think, I can't do this, I'm just, I'm weak. I can't possibly do this on my own. And in the same way that this is up and down, we're up and down spiritually, to the extent that we'll sometimes reach the level of, this is futile, what's the point? I'm a lost cause anyway. Why don't I just continue to live in this corrupt system with this tyrant ruling over my life because I can't do anything about it anyway. And we all go through those same patterns. But then we realize something in the midst of all that. That if you look at if you have any sort of video footage, you re rewind and look at all of that footage. And look at all those people in the square. They're very normal people. Very normal people. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, for some of you, they are your friends, your cousins, your relatives. They're people you know. I know there are people that I know who are out there in the square. And they're the most unlikely people. You know, you're talking about children and young people and parents and sometimes even grandparents. And that shows us that you don't have to be a St. George or a David or one of the very powerful monastic saints to lead a spiritual revolution. Spiritual revolutions will start with the most unlikely of characters. Just like this mishmash of people in the middle of Tahrir Square. And I don't think it started because there was this incredible hero there. It started because of one verse that I don't know if you've come across, but it's as if it was written for this time. Exodus 3, 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now, how relevant does that sound? Now, unfortunately, that, at the time, the shoe was on the other foot. But, you know, let's just pretend it's about us. But it's true. If you look at this, 
This is exactly what happened. And if it happened to people and a nation, it'll happen to us. Now, do we have any Michaels in the room? Do we have any Freds in the room? Good. Let's go with Fred. <laughs> you will never ever look at this verse the same way again. The Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of Fred. I have heard his cry because of his taskmaster, for I know his sorrow. Apply it to yourself. Take that verse, write it down, replace the term, the Egyptians, and put your name in there. And when you get really down, when you think there is no solution, when you think there is no way out, read that verse to yourself. For if we call out, he surely hears our cries. When we feel pain, he understands that pain. And he promises to save us. And he promises to change our lives. So, you saw this unlikely group of heroes in the middle of, of the square who came together and eventually the president was overthrown. I'm sure that a lot of people there didn't actually expect it to happen, although that's what they were calling for. Didn't expect it to happen. And I want to share with you then the next verse from Exodus, that's 3.8. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Suddenly there was hope. And again, I want you to reflect all this to ourselves. When God wants to pull us out of that oppression, he will come down and he will lead us out of that land. If we want to follow him. You see, the, the other thing is, he doesn't say that he will take us. He will lead us. He will lead us out of that land. And give us the promised land. For us, the land of milk and honey is the land of freedom from sin. The land of spiritual strength. The land of being able to live with him unhindered. And we know that that's a promise because in John 8, 36, we know that therefore, if the Son sets you free, then you are what? Free, free indeed. Free indeed. Lord, you know, ink is expensive. So why do you use the word indeed? Why don't you just say, if the Son makes you free, then you are free? Because you wanted to hammer it home. You're really free. You are free indeed. Because sometimes we don't understand the, con the concept of being free indeed. Because we don't think we can be free of sin. We don't think that we can be free from the grasps of Satan. But we are free Indeed. And that's what we have to understand. So, with that, with the president gone, with the head gone, we are suddenly able to see other forms of corruption. Suddenly, all of these other officials and ministers come out of the woodwork. Why? Because they were protected by the president. <coughs> And everything else was screened. And for us, when we start on our spiritual evolution, spiritual journey, once we try to remove that big obstacle, that big obstruction, be careful. Because other things will start to show. So don't be shocked by it. Because sometimes when you have a huge problem in your life and you think, you know, how many of us have thought, and 
I'll ask people, you know, why don't you go to confession? Don't really have anything to confess about. Right? Sometimes we think that. Don't really have anything to confess about. Once you take out the big obstacle, and light starts to pour into your life, you will see the other very small things. You'll see the other forms of corruption that maybe were shadowed by the big one, but they're there. And it's these little things that we would have referred to, you know, in the past as nothing to confess about. But with light coming in, suddenly you realize. Let me give you an example. If we'd have closed these blinds and turned these lights off, the room would be completely dark. And so you would think that the only problem in the room was having those windows covered. Open the windows, open the blinds, and suddenly you'll see clutter on tables and chairs out of the way, and you have to start organizing things. <coughs> so we have to realize that that revolution and this is one problem we'll talk about later. The revolution in Egypt, I think, was a great idea, but it was an ideological revolution. It was never built on a real plan. And so it went up, 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 and fizzled. Although it achieved the target of removing the president and the regime, but it was a sustainable plan. That's something we'll talk about later. I don't want to be too political at the moment. But what we need to learn from that is spiritually, we need to have a sustainable plan. It's a process. Which means that you open the windows and then start to arrange the tables. You'll start to see the other things. In the Song of Solomon 2.15, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. It's, it's the little things, it's the fox, you know, foxes, cowardly creatures. A fox is not going to come and attack you. A fox will look for small creatures. He will look for these vines, these tender grapes. And as we start with our revolution, we have to realize that our situation is going to be very tender. Our situation is going to be very fragile. And you can feel that if you've, if you've You've repented and confessed and you're, you've been with your spiritual father and you want to live a new life. You suddenly feel that it is very fragile. It can't really stand much tension or much movement. You've got to look for the small foxes, the little foxes. The ones that take you by surprise. So look for the small sins and also look for the small things that continue to attack us. And that's why there was something that was pretty much unseen in Egypt, at least in many of our lifetimes. Driving through Tahrir Square was very odd. There was the army in the streets. So vehicles and people who, would you, who you would expect to be on battlefields and in war were on the streets of Cairo. Why? Because once this had happened, there needed to be a restoration of law and order. And it had to be extreme. Because realistically, once you've taken away, let's say, in Egypt at the time, the president and the regime, who's ruling the country? Technically, nobody. Was there any policing in the country? No. Was there law and order? No. So it was a great opportunity for everyone to do everything. And that's why we found you know, quite shameful things like the museum being raided and being robbed. And so you had then tanks in front of the museum. You had tanks in front of various other, you know, national, nationally important and significant monuments. You had the army in the streets trying to protect. And that's because 
Our problem is not just to break down the tyrant. Our problem then is to protect ourselves. Matthew 12, 43. Let's see if you can figure out how this ties in. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. When he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. You see what I'm trying to get at? Once you clean your heart out, you've then got to protect it. Because once you clean your heart out, don't ever think for a minute that Satan is not going to want to get back in there. So once you've sat with your confession, confession father, you've had confession, you've repented, you've cleaned all of that out, don't for a second think that Satan's going to think, okay, fine, you've done that, I respect you now, okay, this is your space. What happens? Uh, have you been on the beach and dug out you know, a, little, a little hole in the sand? What happens with the water as it comes in? It'll constantly just try to fill it up again. If you don't keep digging, or if you don't then protect it and build something around it, it'll be filled in again. That's precisely what happens with our hearts. If we don't keep them protected, post the army around them, post that protection, then we're going to be attacked again. And our situation will be worse. Why? Because Satan will come back and think, huh, look what you did. You repented, you confessed, you had communion, and you know what? I'm back again. What do you think you did? And what you, what you realize if you look at world history Generally, if there are revolutionary steps taken, and the dictators actually overcome them, and they go back into power, they come back much more ruthless. Because they want to prove a point. Did you do this? Did you really throw me out? Now look at what I'm going to do to you. And Satan does the same thing. So we need to protect. Protect our hearts and protect our lives. What we're experiencing now in Egypt is unprecedented. And especially back then, it was a very uncertain time, very uncertain future. Though it was a period of instability. It was something that people hadn't known before. And for us, overcoming Satan also potentially brings in a period of instability. Because sometimes we have lived with sin for so long that we don't know what to do without it. And you'll find this with people who have certain addictions, for instance. You know, someone who smokes. So they get stressed. What's the first thing they do? Reach for a cigarette. But if you throw off smoking, what do you do? How do you deal with it? How do you react? Someone who drinks. When you want to relax, when you want to socialize, you go out and you have a drink. But hang on, I don't want to drink anymore. How do I possibly socialize? What do I do? People with an addiction to, let's say, pornography. Once they have a free minute, what do I do now? The first instinct is to get on my computer and surf the web. And what do I do? And it's, it's a period of instability. It needs to be replaced by something. It needs something else to be in place. Because I don't know what to do. Exodus 16.3 And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the pots of meat, and we ate and were and ate bread and were full. 
For have you brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger? They forgot. They forgot that these people who fed them the meat and the bread were the people who treated them as slaves. And sometimes when we've taken that revolutionary step, we think back and say, well, it wasn't really bad, was it? Come on, it was only a drink every now and then. Come on, it was only a cigarette every now and then. Come on, what's a little bit of this going to hurt? And we think back and think, rather than having this instability, I want to have the stability of what I already know. I want to have the stability of what I'm accustomed to, what I'm used to. Sin becomes so familiar that once I've taken a step and ventured out, and look at the Israelites, they went out. And as they came only out of Egypt, only for a little while, suddenly they were in this wilderness. They didn't think of where they were going, they thought of where they were. They didn't think of where they were going, they thought of where they were. Because if they thought of where they were going, this land promised to them, this land of milk and honey, this land of freedom, do you think they would have thought the same thing? Because how does a land of milk and honey compare to a land of meat and bread, but with slavery? But they thought of where they were, they looked around them, they looked at the wilderness, and they were scared. Just as people in the revolution looked around and looked at the instability and thought, oh, where are we going? Hang on. Maybe, maybe your work wasn't so bad. Maybe you should have just stuck with it. Maybe the tyranny was excusable. Maybe it was all right to feel that. Once we take a step forward, we have to be sure that's where we're going. I want you to have a sustainable revolution that is built on steps forward and that is built upon a vision towards the promised land. It's very easy to look at the world in which we're living now and look around and think, why on earth am I doing this? Why am I trying to live a righteous life? Why am I trying to live holiness? Why? It's such a struggle. Surely, it's just easier to fall into whatever I'm doing. Surely, it's just easier to live a life that I'm accustomed to, live a life like everyone else. But I want us to think ahead. Fine. This life is relatively short. But how does it compare to an eternity in the promised land, in the kingdom of God? <coughs> because I don't think anyone is under the misconception that Tahrir Square was just about January and February of this year and getting rid of the regime and that's it. Tahrir Square in people's minds was about a different future, a better future. <coughs> and that is not going to be built in a day. So as long as people kept looking towards that better future, then they were able to justify the hardship of the time. And just as we are able to keep our eye on the kingdom of God, we'll be able to justify the struggle in this world. Although it seems difficult, and sometimes unneeded. But without it, we can't reach the kingdom. So I talked about wanting a sustainable revolution. A sustainable revolution needs a mechanism. And that's why I think, again, in Tahrir Square, you started to hear these calls for the removal of the regime, wanting a fresh start, wanting a new start. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in Egypt today doesn't give us the same comfort. Because if we really want a new Egypt, or a new Libya, or a new Syria, or a new anywhere, or a new spiritual life for us, it needs to be completely new. 
For no one puts a piece of unshrunken cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. That's what our Lord says to us in Matthew 9, 16. We can't have a patchwork revolution. If you and I want a spiritual revolution and a sustainable, better future, it needs to be a complete change. It needs to be a change that doesn't leave anything of the old man. And that's why St. Paul speaks about this revolution of salvation as a leaving behind of the old man and a putting on of the new man. A putting on. It becomes a full garment. It becomes full protection. And that's why we sometimes like to go for the patched revolution method. We're okay. Um, I'm living this life now, so I'll, I'll overcome this sin and this sin and this sin, but these ones I can't really do, so I'll leave those in place. Or I'll keep living the same life, but I'll just change a few things. It's never sustainable. And if anyone here has tried it, you'll know it's not sustainable. The Israelites <coughs> could not have found the promised land in Egypt. They had to leave Egypt. They couldn't have found the promised land had they kept holding on to their gods of Egypt. That's what we found when Moses went up to see God. And they started to make for themselves again a pagan god. They wanted to go on this journey, leave Egypt, just take bits of it with them. Take the pagan worship with them. No, not at all. You can't do that. When Jacob was called back <coughs> by God, he was told very clearly that he and the people who were with him were to cast off all the things of the pagan gods and leave them all behind. So if we want this sustainable, real, relevant revolution, it's going to be a complete change of heart. It's going to be a complete change of who we are. Because we can patchwork it, but it'll fall apart in a couple of weeks. We can. We can patchwork it. We can put bits and pieces together and get things going that way, but we really won't make a difference. We really won't be what we want. So, let's look at Egypt now. We've gone through all this and we've seen all these regime changes and all this st instability. Is there a brighter future? Now, when you're talking political terms, we don't know. We definitely don't know. And the more we look 